It's time for another game of snow. I love snow. Snow is super popular, especially after yesterday's insane micro. Uh, so we're seeing snow play against some barcode Zerg on the ladder. Um, again, all these games that I'm grabbing, I didn't watch in advance. I'm just snagging them, baby. So with, um, with the map being Apocalypse, let's take a little peek at how this three-player map looks. So... You, you don't have, on Apocalypse, access to a nice ramp for various one-base strategies. Mainly for Protoss and Terran, if they want to do that sort of thing. They actually have to be a little bit thoughtful about this. But generally, players are going straight for the early expands, and you have a third that's right here. But oppressively, you have this like high ground that you have to battle upwards, and the middle of the map is like very wacky looking. So you have a bit of a center, but most of the center of the map are on these like high ground areas here. You have to control your high ground area. So if you have, for instance, a player holding their own, and you're holding your own, there's not even really an opportunity to do much battling here because it's, it's just tricky to abandon your high ground. And so there's a lot of weird, slow, sluggish looking fights that happen in this area. I mean, even these side paths that lead to these I guess I'll call them the fourths that come off the middle here's the other one if you can control your high ground pod yes you can kind of dip over to this way and you can kind of dip over to this way but really most of the of the battling is going to be over the pod that you and your opponent uh, over the pod that is not one of god I don't know how to make this sentence is really getting away from me this is snow's high ground this is Zerg's high ground. This is Neither's high ground. This is the relevant one to grab. The third pod. <laughs> and so, um, there, there's kind of something that you may have seen me do as a theme in every one of these Brood War little analysis slash hangout slash rant sessions with your pal Sean. Um, there's always a question of where am I directing my plan at like the 30 to 40 minute mark? Towards. What is that actually going to be targeting? Because let's imagine for a moment that the Zerg player is doing something very typical, getting, you know, a bunch of Hydras in the mid game to hold some stuff while they try to start securing a fourth base and things like this. Let's say the Protoss player goes for two bases with either Zealot or Forge and then goes for Corsairs and blah, blah, blah. It is possible for, like Snow, to just win with Zealot pressure, to win with Corsairs and DTs, or it's very possible for a Zerg player with great Hydra control to just smash through, shut down the third, and close the game out there. These are opportunities, not goals. If you think of it in terms of a goal as a player, you're gonna suddenly be up against the player that knows how to hold off that attack, and now what? So, in my eyes, the only way I was ever able to stop getting completely smashed <laughs> in situations where my early attack didn't win, what do I do? The only way to avoid this is to say, what, what's your long-term plan in this match? And it's definitely gonna be controlling this. So if I'm a Zerg player, I want to get control of this area and maybe start moving out into this spot or slip around this way and try to start smashing my way in here with Lurker Hydra, sweeps around this to this area. Sure, to be able to close in on the center as an opportunity, that's great. But I want to be able to secure this and start getting these up. I might want to do something like take this as a bit of a sneaky hatch, get a Nidus Canal, and then begin to plow my way forward with Lurker Defiler. Three-player maps I, I quite like generally as a Zerg player because you can get map control and seize this, the third pod, uh, a high percentage of the time. So the question is, as we get kicked off into the game, turn this off, turn this on, turn this off. What are Dem players doing? Well, I quite like what both players are doing. I just love this opening. The, the, the early one gate zealot pressure, I just think it's awesome. If any of you are new, just build a forge, don't do this. Play for a year and then you, you have permission to do this. <laughs> um, but we're seeing the Zerg go for hatchery and gas a little early to then follow this up with um, an expansion. 
and naturally following this up with a third hatchery at a third expansion. But the thing that is making this a bit of a variation from the usual opening, the usual opening I would say is hatch or pool in just either order, and then a hatch, and then a gas geyser. The reason this variation's a little different is by getting speed early, you can shut down this zealot aggression and start applying pressure back. Snow's build doesn't change, you just keep making zealots, but it, it's about the comfort of controlling all these different locations. And with zergling speed, you can actually start eliminating guesswork. And I, I actually do want to talk about this a little bit. I, I've been saying again and again and again in all of these broadcasts that the theme of, um, I'm actually going to shift tab this to make this a little easier to see. Wow, that really didn't help, did it? Okay. <laughs> the theme of StarCraft in the last few years has been interesting improvised aggression. It has been things like dynamic attacks of these zealots based upon what the probe scout is doing. It has been dynamic counterattacks from the Zerg player. It has been things like the Zerg going, aha, I have now shut down scouting, so the Protoss can't know if I'm going for a Hydralisk bust, or whether I'm going for a fourth hatch, or whether I'm going, there it is, or whether I'm going for a fast layer. You can't know. And so getting Zergling speed, keeping a sharp eye on this overlord of, hey, did any other probes come out? No, all right, I can leave all six of these right here and I know that I'm safe. I really like this style. I've seen Soma do this a lot. These kinds of like, get some lanes with speed and shut down the Protoss's ability to do scouting. And then the Zerg can be greedy, can be more efficient with drones. Figuring out when you can and can't make a drone is a freaking nightmare in this game. Oh my god. And what is this early Evo chamber going to be all about? Is this going to be Carapace? Yo! Yo! Oh my god! Are we? Are we in 2002? Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Once upon a time, people discovered that the Zergling was like the best unit in the game. The Zergling is so stupidly good. You get an insane amount of damage output from this turkey, especially if you can get to Hive Tech. The Zergling is awesome. Zerglings are also very inexpensive. They're very cheap. They are good against pretty much everything that the Protoss makes early game, except for Psionic Storm and Zealots that have plus one attack. We see plus one attack has not yet been started. If the Zealots are ahead of Zerglings in attack upgrade, that is one attack versus zero carapace, or even three attack versus two carapace, if the Protoss is ahead in attack, Zealots shred Zerglings. They kill them in two hits instead of three. And so one of the earliest plays that Zerg players did was to say, yo, if I can get plus one carapace and I get it started before you, I can just only get Zerglings, the super efficient, powerful, potent unit. And as long as I'm good at dodging the storms or picking off the High Templar, oh, I'll be the greatest player in the world. So this getting this started right now kind of guarantees a lot of power for the Zerg for the whole game, as opposed to the usual, oh, the Protoss is ahead on upgrades, they're powerful, boom, I caught up in Carapace, now I'm powerful. Bam, Protoss is ahead in uh, attack, now I'm ahead. What started to emerge um, after Bisu's use of Corsairs, just wrecking Savior 3-0 in the MSL Finals. One of the greatest nights of my life watching that. It was so cool. Then what happened is this huge swell of Corsair pressure to deal lots of damage to the Zerg. So the Zerg started to rush for Lair to get Scourge to deal with the Corsairs and then begin to transition into a large army of Hydralis because I can't really rely on the Zerglings. The Protoss player who went Corsair also has plus one attack, so maybe I'll need to just rely on Hydralis. So then the players started to go for these large Hydralis um, mid games as Zerg, but then they started to go away. Why am I rushing for the Scourge? Why don't I just start applying pressure early on against these Protoss players that are going for Corsairs. And you start to see early aggression with um, Hydralisks on three uh, hatcheries as Zerg. You even start to see players go Hydralisk aggression 
into layer and then a fourth and fifth hatch and not worry at all about the scourge and then later begin to add a spire for surprise attacks against corsairs so it started to be this really dynamic mutalisk hydralisk mid game for zerg players including early hydra aggression versus protoss is starting to pepper in more uh early zealot pressure more two gate zealots in addition to getting the stargates to apply pressure it was a really sort of interesting dynamic opening. And now, hilariously, we see this coming all the way back around. Well, hey, now that I know that the meta includes things like fast zergling speed to shut down scouts so then I can go into a three base Hydra bust or deny scouts so I can then rush up to layer and surprise you with a swell of mutalisks and so on and so on. There's all these things that exist as sort of big branches of concerns let me throw in another thing. The old school play of rushing for Carapace. Critically, this player got a fourth hatch right now. What we're going to see likely out of our Zerg hero here is relying more on Spore Colonies and Zerglings to defend against the aggression of the Zealots and the Spore Colonies to deal with the Stargates. This is, this is really exciting to be watching. Also, it's an interesting meta shift. A lot of Protoss players started to do things like favor the armor upgrade over the attack upgrade because the armor upgrade is more effective against hydras for reasons but this is this is just thrilling so you'll see a single drone in here to eventually get towards layer and again the logic will be that more post bisu response of rush for scourge to deal with that stuff yeah see look here's the spore colonies and you'll also see on the mini map there's just lots and lots and lots of um places where overlords would normally be like this overlord that was at the front. Gasp, where did that go? Well, I mean, you just pull every single overlord back home to sit on top of these. Okay. Hmm. Cellmate, good to see you. Good to see you, Cellmate. Happy Wednesday, my dude. So, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so you see lots of Zerglings getting made. We see no layer yet. We see Spore Colonies being the way to deal with the Corsairs. And all the Overlords will get made out of these two hatches. This, this is like so subtle, but uh, it's subtle until you play a Zerg in this position like I did and you get absolutely smacked. And then you go, I'm never going to do that again. I want to build as few Spore Colonies as possible to defend my Overlords. I want to build it next to where there are two hatcheries. In theory, I could build the Spore Colony here, but then there's only one hatchery. So if for some reason I fall behind and I need to quickly make overlords, I want two hatches worth of larva making those overlords right here. Subtle and good. And this is this is a crazy move from uh, our hero Snow to just be target firing this. So this was a little bit miscalculated from the um, Zerg player, but it's not so bad. Corsair is going to pop out. There's not enough scouting information, so this uh, Protoss player does need to build this in here. And Zerglings are perfectly acceptable at picking these off. They're super inexpensive, super cheap. Most of the drones have survived. A fifth hatch is going to be popping down as well as a layer. <laughs> no! There's a fifth hatch going down. Look, five hatches before layers with the power plus one carapace. Now, Zerg needs to be very diligent about getting a layer right away. One thing that this has as a cascading consequence is that if you get plus one early, you then have to get your layer to get plus two, which then forces you to get your spire to get plus three. And there are certain styles of Zerg that are incompatible with that pacing. Here's the plus one attack, but it's not going to matter. When carapace comes out, it's going to be a holy guacamole moment. Hydralisk Den comes down. There's Layer going down. Hydralisk Den, everything that I said before about, hey, it's really helpful to have Hydralisks in the mid game, still holds true. And I'm very, excuse me, curious how the uh, Protoss player is going to respond to this. Getting Zealot Legs, which apparently is called Leg Enhancements. I played this game forever. I never even knew the name of this thing. Leg Enhancements, man, it's crazy. Actually, I'm going to try to shift tab this. I think the minimap is easier to read. So this this is a bit of the pickle that emerges if you try to do this kind of style. 
where you are relying on spore colonies. This is one of the reasons why the Hydralis Den has to come up. You'll note that, yeah, sure does look like snow is just still really good. Picking off all these things. And it's kind of an acceptable and understood thing. God, the timing on this is just incredible. Look at this. They're both going to finish at the exact same time. Please start plus two. You're going to be my hero. if you. Yeah, there it is. Bam, what an incredible Zerg. So, I mean, this, this looks super poopy for our um, Zerg hero in some ways. But keep in mind, you have the attack up, or the, the, the edge on the upgrade war. You have so much ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your opponent. The one thing that's missing for Zerg is a sixth hatchery. That's really going to send this over the top. But you'll probably need a couple more rounds of drones and stuff. All right. Big goal out of snow right now is just getting a huge flood of Zealot Templar. Also getting double forge here. Double forge means there's not going to quite be enough gas to make uh, extra dragoons and some of these other utility units for a while. But that's okay. Going to Zealot High Templar with a few Corsairs is going to be effective. And here's the Zerglings getting produced in lieu of Hydras. I mean, some Hydras exist. Hey, then, the Greases, what do you think Zerg's strategy is here? Looks like a lot of Econ and Macro, but what is their Knockout Punch to capitalize? Yeah, so, um, Knockout Punches do not exist in StarCraft 1. How dare you ask me such a StarCraft 2 style question, Nathan, the degree. <laughs> um, Sean, you're still not answering my question. Um, well, that's fine. I love hearing myself talk. That's why I'm alone in a room. Um, <laughs> so there's going to be a story that's going to happen for about the next five minutes, leading up to 13, 14 minutes. The story is... Protoss has this swell of gateways. We see eight. It's feeling great. But Protoss is making the cheap units. This is 100 minerals. This is 50 minerals, 150 gas. The expensive units would be Dark Templar and Dragoons. Our Protoss here is going to be making lots of the cheap stuff. This will allow the Protoss to get lots of control over the map. If we actually just take a look at the Protoss vision, you can see that the Corsairs are sweeping, hunting for any... Get out of the way. They're sweeping and hunting for any overlords here. The uh, Protoss will be able to have Zealots and High Templar. Zerg is going to have an awful time pushing up this. So the Protoss wants to hold this and get a third. For Zerg, it's kind of the same story with different units. Zerg wants to get enough Zerglings to sweep up on each side. Zerglings don't clog as much as Hydralis. You can sweep up clamp these and push back given the fact that the zerg player has this you know carapace upgrade started and is ahead of the uh protoss player in terms of upgrades the zerglings will remain good and then the zerg wants to control this area and hopefully delay this third as long as possible and if the zerg player is uh able to pick off this third oh my god what a great benefit but the expectation is that the protoss will get this this is tucked hard against this wall you make a few cannons leave a templar there and then rally into this neck between the two and you'll be fine so both players are going to try to jam forward hey single dt and really it's going to be a battle over these high grounds the expected neutral case is zerg has their high ground protoss has their high ground and no one can do anything which then would lead to the next sort of bit of the strategy. Okay, well then what? What's Zerg trying to do? Zerg is, again, hunting for a sixth hatchery and is going to be going for a large Zealot Hydralisk collection, maybe even getting lurkers, but it's okay to delay those a little bit, with the eventual target of being securing this and these locations. Zerg will almost guaranteed get this as the fourth base, but it's just, you know... A sixth hatch plus a seventh and an eighth here to still get control of this. Once Zerg gets this fourth, it's going to be hive tech and going in that direction. Once the Protoss gets this, again, it's also going to be, well, maybe I'd want to get this one, but it is in between us. I'll probably have to go for this. And you can again see how this, this high ground pot is, is critical for that. Oh my god, I love this game so much. Holy moly, this is the coolest game ever. 
My god, what did I just say about Zergling sweeping in from both sides, clamping to pick off these zealots as they're trying to contain the high ground? It's almost as though I've played 30,000 hours of this game. <laughs> a DT can actually be really annoying for uh, preventing control over these areas. But, you know, I, I think the Protoss knows what the name of the game is, which is just going to be like macroing as best they can with Zealot, a High Templar, occasionally making an Archon, but more often than not, just keeping them all as stormy boys. With the uh, Double Forge upgrades, this is extremely gas intensive. So it is just going to be masses and masses of these Zealots. Dude, I'm telling you, the single DT is brilliant. This all but guarantees that this Nexus gets to start. Lumker. Hey, what do you know? Six Hatchery. Uh, six Hatches is a little pricey to um, get, so need a couple more drones getting produced. So these Dragoons, wow, this is, this is a bit bold to make this many Dragoons right now. So... Dragoons are very expensive. You'll see that a couple of these gateways don't even have Dragoons producing out of them. This set of attack and defense upgrades is very gas intensive. You can see super broke. So, I mean, I guess the statement is get a few Dragoons to help once more to try to push forward, to help once more to try to deal with these armies from the Zerg. Do you actually have 30,000 hours on this game? I mean, almost certainly. Almost certainly. This is the only game that I played for like, am I doing this computation wrong? I think it was 30,000 games, maybe. Whatever it is. Let's see, because the, the only thing that I did was play StarCraft for about 15 years. So if that's, say, 2,000 hours a year, like definitely spent like if 40 hours a week doing that let's call it 30 hours a week so that's 1500 hours in a year so after 10 years that's 15,000 hours um, so then another 5 years of that so we broached 20,000 hours yeah no yeah no, I, I think I said it right I think I said it right because that was just from launch to when Starcraft 2 came out yeah and I'm also lumping in all the hours that I've watched as well. All the hours that I watched as well. So, yeah, yeah, great. BSETV says, I have 35,000 in StarCraft II with almost zero weeks off, so it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's 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 kind of funny because when I said someone's like 30,000 hours, it sounds like so much. And I was like, wait a minute, how many hours are in a year? <laughs> I've played 300 billion hours of StarCraft. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so yeah, no, I think 30,000 is... 30,000 might actually be low. <laughs> oh, God. But, yeah, I mean, like, building the Dragoon... I mean, it could also be said that Snow thought that there was going to be one type of aggression, but then because there was not... All right, maybe there's a pullback and is instead focusing on a more dragoon heavy thing. Dragoons are are very helpful at busting down lurkers that are trying to control high grounds. But everything is kind of happening as expected. Um, you heard me mention that you you do need to get the pace of your hive pretty quick because if you don't, then all of a sudden you have plus two and you can't get plus three. So you are kind of obligated to get a hive. Although I would say that the hive is a bit delayed from a Zerg. And Protoss is still just going to be going for... 303. Who's the barcode player? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. This is just a ladder game, and I was just looking at uh, Buy Snow's ladder game. I love Snow. Snow is so good. All right. Oh my god. TT1. Dude, this is like a cockroach. He always comes back. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Dude, by on. You must have been at home, and you heard... You're like, oh, what's that? What is that? What's that shadow darting across the floor? Oh my god, what is it? And then you look, you shown a flash night. And it was flashlight, it was a Twitch stream. Day 9 TV. Oh, you're not talking about me, you're talking about Jin Jin? Yeah, he's always lurking, isn't he? <laughs> we even tried to ban Jin Jin, and he still is here in our chat. It's actually kind of remarkable how resilient Jin Jin is. 
Uh, but TT1, for those of you who don't know, is one of the most legendary non-Korean uh, StarCraft 1 players of all time. Um, maybe the, the only thing that TT1 is better at than StarCraft 1 is having strong opinions about Canadian hockey. Um, <laughs> TT1 is also um, one of the top performers in StarCraft 2 at launch. Because, I'll be real, TT1 is the only fucking player that macroed, man. Like, that was it. Like, everyone was like, I will transition to this unit and to that unit and get a range upgrade for my Colossus. And TT1's like, I made five more gateways. Let's go. <laughs> I fucking won all these tournaments early on. That's uh, so funny. All right. Okay. Let's come back to this game. So, yeah, I mean, Dragoons are very good at breaking these lurker positions. But, I mean, Zerg has their high ground. Protoss has their high ground, you know. These little counterattacks are always irrelevant to me in terms of analysis. Because if they work, awesome. They typically don't work when I do them. So I fueled with jealousy. Yep. Again, two hatcheries down here. Hive is incoming. These little moves are so annoying, dude. Like, if these are cracklings, you can actually just like kill the whole the whole base. It's pretty funny, man. Is he like sending them through this little little side sideways thing? It's quite funny. More gateways plopping on down, observers coming on out. And both players are really preparing for the battle over this region. Zerg, you you really need to build these hatches like five minutes ago, man. I, I don't actually think getting both these Evo chambers is correct. I think just getting the attack until you can get these and then getting the range. Such is my opinion. There's your two hatches. Alright, here we go. Here we go, here we snow. So all these little motions from each player are really revealing. The Protoss player cuts all the way to this side before moving down. Obviously, you can just position in the middle and try to clamp in, but like trying to sweep up here with Zealots, then sweep down here, it's another way to sort of secure this. Because that's the long-term play. And again, these are opportunities. Wow, look at this. Plus two Zerglings. Plus two attack. Protoss is ahead on the attack upgrade, because this hasn't started Carapace. That's actually pretty incredible from Snow. Finally. So these are all opportunities, Dragoons and Templar. You know, I actually take back what I said earlier about, ooh, yeah, this seems like a kind of a dangerously early time to go for Dragoons. Looking at this, if Snow went for more Zealots, as would be more common in a more open map, like, you know, I mean, frankly, a lot of the maps in this current map rotation have more open space and more difficult to secure forts and stuff like that. Then, then I might have favored that. But here, yeah, Zerg's just going to be able to get this fourth base. So you're not under that much threat as the Zerg player, I mean, as the Protoss player. So you may as well just begin massing the Dragoon numbers right now to apply pressure. Now, I'm curious what the transition timings are going to look like, but, dude, again, so smart. Single DT here in case a counterattack has just enough to kill the Zealots. Still can't kill the DT. Probably will want to get more Reavers coming up here. Probably. Obviously, there's going... Oh, is there not three in the geyser? Ooh, how embarrassing. So, if I'm Zerg, which I often am, Defilers are going to be the ticket. And again, it literally is slowly puncturing your way up this way to get control of just this area. I mean, this is it. This is the game right here. This is the whole shebang. Protoss, Reavers, Reaver pressure. Continuing to hold this middle and being as annoying as possible. And I actually think drops are really good. In, in four-player maps, the bases are just naturally more clamped together. Like in Fighting Spirit, like... Your, your main, second, and third take up, like, this much space in Fighting Spirit. It's so packed in the corner, man. But um, you wind up with so much spread that I think these drop plays, this is actually really good. I really like this. I'm imagining myself losing to this and going, yeah, that would be really hard to hold off. More annoying little Zergling thingies here. And again, these are... Plus two carapace cracklings. Are they cracklings? 
So sometimes they can actually do amazing wonders. Dude, the mass DT drop. Noni used to just fuck me up with this stuff, man. Because DTs kill bases so fast. They kill everything so fast. Four DT. Dude, Noni used to do, like, double shuttle mass DT drop. It was, it was such a nightmare. All the while, snow is slowly storming, storming, storming. Trying to get more control. And I mean, if you're against a really fearsome Protoss, they'll take a fifth here. Oh my god, that's so much stuff. Oh my god. Zestal says it was cool seeing Noni stream during the Stormgate beta. Yeah, I watched a lot of Noni during that period of time. So still no transition to Reavers. There it is. There's the Reaver transition. This is the necessary thing in late game. And by the way, a lot of times when I'm speaking really authoritatively, this is the thing you want to do. You want to do this. Uh, I recognize that for people that play Brood War, you're like, yeah, no shit. But I know there's a lot of new uh, Brood War viewers here. <laughs> so with new Brood War viewers, I want to be very clear. You need a transition to Reavers because, again, Reavers have a ranged attack that does splash damage, meaning it does work for full damage under Dark Swarm, which only prevents ranged non-splash damage. Oh, it's so nasty. Dude, I remember when I was at like my competitive height and I was playing on uh, Icy Cup and PG Tour. It was called PG Tour back then. But I remember playing games against Bisu and just like, I mean, literally from like, minute two, I was like, oh yeah, I'm fucked, man. Every time there would be a situation like this, I'd be like, oh my god, I'm gonna hold it off. I would, like, send an overlord, and, like, this base would be taken, this base would be taken, and this base would be taken, and I'm like, oh, I'm getting clowned on, aren't I? <laughs> oh yeah, this person's just literally, absolutely, like, leagues above me. Oh man, what a, what a mess. Yeah, that was, that was when Medusa was a popular, uh, map. So, double robo facility for shuttles. We see plague getting researched. And for Zerg, I would actually, in this spot, be like, all right, I'm doing okay. I'm holding on. I have not taken massive harass damage at this third. It's got a lot of drones. I might build some sunken colonies here because I'm uh, insecure about my ability to manage. How does Burrow work under Dark Swarm? Um, uh, what do you mean? Uh, Ma Magus K Tricks. Herbmon, thanks for the raise. The Brood War Sensei is back home. Well, let's just call me a, a... Well, maybe with Brood War, I might consider myself competent enough to provide good educational content. StarCraft 2, I'm absolutely a total newbie. Yeah, I guess, I guess the basic statement is burrowed units, whether a unit is burrowed or not, has no impact on how it receives damage. The only thing that matters is if you can detect it or not. If you have detection, you can deal damage to it. If you don't have a detection, you can't deal damage with it. So a lurker burrowed under Dark Swarm or unburrowed under Dark Swarm takes damage in the exact same way. So I mean, oh, this is, so this is the sort of thing that, this is a bit of a sly move. You move this way to do counterattacks where this can force the Protoss player to unposition themselves. You need enough spread because Storms deal so much damage. And then the Zerg's going to be able to cut this way and move up like that. Maybe not now, but eventually. Defiler energy for a Plague in a Dark Swarm. But yeah, see, still angling to this side. This right side of the map is where all the actions needs to happen. Is Archon ranged attack? Archon is a ranged attack that has an additional splash, so the ranged component of the attack doesn't deal damage under Dark Swarm, but the splash component attached to the ranged attack does deal damage under Dark Swarm. <laughs> So 
So you can see it's dealing little tiny flecks of damage. Uh, Zetra, uh, my schedule for this month, I planned before I downloaded any of these games. So you can see the Zerg's moving in from this side. I didn't, I didn't, for instance, open up Hearthstone and say, I'm going to play this shit till I think it sucks, and then I'm going to switch to StarCraft. Uh, this is StarCraft week. Last week was Hearthstone week, and next week is World of Warcraft week. So yeah, th these little counterattack moves are really nice, but again, sight set on this side, because dude, look at this. Snow is continuing to gobble up the areas of the map. Now, Zerg, Zerg does not actually mine out in the main that quickly. You don't have that many um, drones mining. Protoss, of course, mines out stupidly fast. Wow, nothing mining here? Oh, I've seen some players do this. This is really interesting. Um, if things are getting a little grisly in late game, if you have focused on mining out the vulnerable bases first, and then you can retreat back to this base, you can do some good stuff. Oh yeah, and then there's Reavers getting built here. Three shuttle Reaver, yeah. The transition for Protoss in late game situations is, is, is I'm gonna call it basically Archon Reaver. It's basically Archon Reaver. Basically, because you do have High Templar, you do have some Dragoons, you'll get some DTs in there, you might get some other weird stuff, but like, Really, it's Archon Reaver Templar, man. You are blowing stuff up under Dark Swarm. There is no efficient way for Zerg to deal with this, so Zerg has to conquer this entire right side of the map. It's just slow death for the Protoss at this point. Until Protoss can start transitioning into that insanely juicy composition. Look at this, all Templar. Some DT is going in there. So, I mean, this this is quite offensive. This is just so rude. So Perlos is now actually moving out. Or excuse me, Zerg's now moving out. Because you can see the Zerg has not even had a good opportunity to scout. It's just how do I kind of wobble back and forth and try to find vulnerable uh, locations. I mean, this is cute, but I think this is just destined for death. Yeah, now all of a sudden, all these locations are revealed, and Zerg's gonna try to slowly goop up this side. I mean, this is, oh, oh God. Oh my God. Chocchi says, I imagine Arbiter Recall could be useful against any opponent. It, it It's less in vogue in the modern day and age. Um, Zerg units, there's so many of them that spread out so much stasis is not very good. So it's basically just a statement about is recall worth it or not. And generally what Protoss has favored doing at this point is just defending on this many bases. If for some reason the Protoss can hold this, or actually let me let me do a much simpler uh, uh, statement. Let's imagine that there is a map where I, the Zerg player, if I take half the map, that's eight bases. And if you take half the map, that's eight bases. So we each have eight bases. So what's the goal if we both have that much? Well, for Protoss, it's win the war of attrition because eventually the Protoss player will out-efficiency the Zerg player and win. In fact, you could probably win with seven bases of Protoss versus eight bases of Zerg, maybe nine bases of Zerg. Um, so given that, are Arbiters helpful if you get to a seven versus eight base situation? Not, not especially. I mean, I guess it could help you recall a bunch of things from one side to the other, but you're already getting shuttles for the Reavers, and you're already doing things like building a robotics facility at every single location to make sure that it can't get counterattacked by uh, Dark Swarm. So, typically you're just going to be playing defensively. Now, Zerg is moving up this way. This is this is kind of a, I would call this a wacky decision. This is This is the scary stuff here. If Zerg wants to be here for a little bit and then unburrow and collapse this way, then then I'm on board. Because I mean, you're just you're just not going to break this. Protoss doing this is bold, so Protoss just pulls back when they see that there's units here. Cannons a plenty, cannons a plenty. 
Again, this is this this is destined for death. It doesn't really matter that much, but you know, you may as well if you have this much money coming in. So Zerg is slowly working the way up this way. This is this is a pretty weak looking army. Like dragoons, dragoons just they kind of suck. They kind of suck in this matchup. I mean, th they do stuff, but they're not like the way that a reaver or a high templar or an archon does stuff. Please hit the T button. Hit the T button. No, didn't even cast. No, oh my god. Protoss was busy trying to manage this side of the map. Oh man. Yeah, I mean, this, this makes sense. Just getting some La Défense up. I really don't know about this, man. This is the problem with trying to hold two of these pods at once. Dude, this, this literal Archon Reaver army is so stupidly good. <laughs> just shoots the shuttle down. I mean, may, maybe if you treat this as like a hidden expansion, but I mean, it, it just gets spotted like immediately. Yeah, destined for death. But now that Zerg has this, this is where I'm going to be doing Rally City. Rally City, baby. I just care about these two. Protoss can have this fourth as far as I'm concerned. So this is the most efficient defense of all time. Templar out of the gateways. Uh, Reavers out of the robo. Yeah, I, 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 I don't. I really, I'm not as big a fan of this from Zerg. Yeah, you can defend this, but like, dude, there's a DT in there that just killed all those drones. Zerg's getting a little split focused. Like, dude, this, this doesn't matter. This is always going to be able to get storm dropped, reaver dropped, hit from the high ground. Dude, pure Zergling versus pure Archon, but the Zerglings are somehow going to come across and and do a pretty okay job. DC Jaxes, do people use Guardians? I mean a little bit. I mean a little bit. Like at this at this point in the game, yes, you sometimes do have Guardian play. Uh, but in the mid-game, generally not. You're so gas starved from going to Filer Lurker. See? Destined for death. Zerg is out. Zerg is broke. This is why this area was so important. And you'll note that like once the middle got broken, Snow just stopped attacking. Just just bailed watch an ASL. I do not miss a single game of ASL. Although I do tend to watch it slowly because I watch it on Sundays with my buddies. Yeah, this this is this is a great spot for Snow. Where Snow's like, yeah, let's fight over this base endlessly. I'll just keep taking these ones over here. Well, Shlobo says, I don't know if this has been asked, but would you consider casting analyzing one of your past games for when you were professional? I, I don't even know how I would get the replays for that. I used to have them on a hard drive, but that hard drive, um, like, I think, like, battery acid <laughs> spilled on it. <laughs> so, like, it's, I don't even know how to turn it on. It was in a box of electronics that I've just carried from, like, house to house to house to house. It's like a... It's like my 20 year old box of garbage. And like, I looked at it and it just had, it had like half melted. And there was like one of those batteries that just has like what appears to be a fungal growth coming out of it. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure this battery broke open and melted this thing. <laughs> and I just put it back in the fucking box and closed it. And it's there. It's like in the closet there. And my cat's like napping on it. I don't want to open that shit, but I am going to bring it the next time I move. I think Zerg was actually in an okay position-ish. But, I mean, doing things like dropping Lurker Defiler here to take this area, and then puncturing up this way, or devoting all resources to this side, clearing this is good. But, I mean, at this point, Snow just capitalized on claiming the middle so well. What a great match this one was. Got a PvP I'm gonna watch after this. And I'm gonna call it a day. I mean, they're chatting. They're chatting, dude. Let me open this up. Speed it up. Yeah, it's got to be almost done. GG. Hey. Hey, excuse me. Hey, excuse me. Well, that's GG. And exit, exit.